Здравствуйте. Вы меня слышите? Хорошо. А, хм. Вот а, доклад был объявлен, что будет по-английски, и, по-моему, должен быть по-английски, потому что вот так было объявлено. И, а, и честно говоря, у меня будет, будут проблемы с терминологией, если я попытаюсь там по-русски. Русский у меня хорош, но насчет терминологии не так уж. Вот. Okay, so now I, I switch to English. Um, I have. Um, I, I, okay, D -d this is a talk about combining, adapting, and reusing by text between related languages with application to statistical machine translation. And I have uh, three parts of the talk. The first part is a brief introduction to statistical machine translation. The second part is the core of the talk. And the third one is some thoughts about machine translation in general. So uh, if we don't have time, we can skip the last part. And I want to find now, out right now whether we, we need the first part. Do you guys need a short introduction to machine translation? Yes? OK. You don't have the full, the full version. <coughs> OK. <coughs> so yeah, this is the point of the talk. The first, the introduction. Second, the, the, full, uh, the main uh, part of the talk, and then some further discussion. So statistical machine translation, the so how it works, it um, trains, it, it learns from the live text, so it learns from examples. You give it uh, example um, text, example sentences. Okay, this is a sentence in Arabic, this is another translation in English. By the way, I work in the Arabic, in, in an Arabic country, in the Qatar Computing Research Institute, in the Arabic Language Technologies Group, so I have to show you a slide in Arabic, okay? I'll have examples in English. <coughs> Don't worry about that. So how, how machine translation works? Well, uh, it makes observations uh, over those examples and learns from there how to translate individual words and, and some short phrases and so on, um, and uses this to translate new sentences. So uh, basically, at the core of tr translation is the noisy channel model. And the idea is uh, this comes from cryptography. So during the Second World War, there has been a lot of research uh, in the US and essentially worldwide. There was a big push in cryptography. Um, actually, some of the best scientists moved into the field. Uh, one example is uh, Jonathan Asuf, the father of computer, uh, the, the father of the first computer before ENIAC. This is the Atanasov Berry computer. Jonathan Asuf is a Bulgari Bulgarian descent. After a lot of fights in courts, he has been recognized as the father of computer. Uh, he essentially abandoned his research on creating com compu the computer uh, in the University of Iowa uh, after mo and, and moved instead to cryptography during the war and never returned to this research. So um, with all this background and with all this research in cryptography, people thought that maybe machine translation can be solved, can, can be seen as a cryptography task. So this is what Warren Waver said. Okay, uh, when I look at an article in Russian, I say that's really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will, need, uh, I will now proceed to decode. So you have, uh, um, so here you have one example. So basically you can like figure out which word corresponds to what, and then you try to, to do some kind of decoding. That's, this is a very naive idea, but this is still very powerful, and this is at the core of machine translation today, statistical machine translation. So basically, the idea is that uh, you have, with some probability, somebody says something in English, and then it's transmitted, this English sentence is transmitted over the, the noisy channel model, and you, you hear, you get French instead. So now, now the task is that if you have this French sentence, and if you have some idea about how English gets corrupted into French, and then if you have also some idea about how likely somebody to say something, some particular sentence in English, then, you know, given those three components, you have to find the best, uh, you know, you, you to make the best uh, guess about what was the original English sentence. So that's how it works. So basically, we have three components. You have something that, that models the source, so how likely is somebody to say something in English, uh, then something that, that uh, models the, the correspondence between the English and the French, and then uh, you have a search algorithm that keeps proposing uh, good um, candidates, and those should be candidates that are liked by both models, by the source model, it's called the language model here, and by the translation model. So basically, those are the three basic components of a machine tra statistical machine translation system. <coughs> the language model, it uh, wants to show you, um, you know, if you have good English, 
it should assign it high probability. If it's bad English, it should assign it low probability. The translation model wants to tr has to translate, uh, uh, takes an English and a French sentence and assigns it high probability if it's a, a good translation, if they, they are good translations of each other, and low probability otherwise. And the decoder keeps proposing new hypotheses, and the two models score them and say how much they like them. <coughs> so, um, and here's how they, they, they work together. So, if you want to translate to English the Russian phrase Krasnets Krasne we talk, um, so if you have a flower red, uh, the language model doesn't like it because this is not good in English. The translation model likes it because it has the same meaning. Okay, it's not exactly grammatical, but the meaning is there. So the product of the two is low. Um, so here we have the other, the, uh, the reverse case, a red dog. This is grammatical, so the language model likes it. The translation model doesn't because this is not translation of Krasnets we talk. So the, the, the product is bad and a red flower is something that both models like. And so you have like a, dec kind of a decoder that keeps proposing new hypotheses and they get scored by the two models. So how, how does the language model works? Uh, the language model, okay, so um, yes, the language model is trained, um, has to prefer good to bad English. So good doesn't exactly mean grammatical. Uh, and bad means unlikely. So. Um, I have here some examples. I don't like strong tea, this is good. I don't like powerful tea, this is bad because this is not uh, you know, quite fluent uh, and so on. And actually, you know, I, I can, okay, to get the idea about you know, what is grammatical but low probability here, I have a poem. Okay, I have a spelling checker, it came with my PC, uh, it plainly marks for my review, mistakes I cannot see and so on. I have run this poem through it. I'm sure you are pleased to know. It's letter perfect all the way. My checker told me so. So you see here, you know, some kind of crappy thing that is perfectly grammatical. You know, the verb is a verb. You know, the, the grammatical structure is there, but the meaning is, is not something that you expect. So this is not something that people are likely to say. And, you know, a Russian example, Tarapushka был голодным, голодный, проглотил утюг холодный. Okay, this is a real sentence from... Uh, uh, you know, the literature, but it's not something that, that people would, you know, it's, it's something of very high probability, right? So you don't want to generate translations that, that have more, more probability. Um, and the good thing about language model is trained on monolingual text, so all you need is like, say, if you translate into English, you need a lot of English text. This means that, you know, if you look here at the components, okay, <coughs> So for the translation model, you need training data. You have example. You need examples of French and English sentences, and this is hard to get. I mean, you, uh, while for the language model, you only need English sentences, which means that you can like by separating the two, you can kind of you know train them on, on different kind of data. And for English, you can you can get a lot of data. So for example, Google trains a language model on the entire web, okay, which which gives it a big advantage. Um, okay. And then how do you calculate the probability? Very briefly, so we have like an n-gram language model, which is the probability of, of a sequence of words by the chain rule. You can write it in this particular way, and then uh, you can approximate. This is nothing wrong has been done so far. And here we have a first order mark of uh, approximation, where we say the, that the prob the, you know, this is the probability of the first word, and then times the probability of the second given the first, the third given the first instead of the previous two, and so on. You kind of forget about the previous history. And that's all. And how you learn those, how do you learn the probability? Okay, so for example, I eat an apple is the probability of I given the start of a sentence times the probability of eat given I times the probability of an given eat and apple given an and so forth. And how do you, do you calculate those probabilities? Well, basically, the probability of a word given a previous word is just how many times you have seen in a large body of text those two words next to each other divided by how many times you have seen the previous word. That's all. Okay, you can take, uh, need to take some special care when you have division by zero or rare events and so on, but there's detail. Okay, that's about the language model. Um, so, about the translation model. Um, it cannot really be estimated directly. So just like with the language model, we cannot calculate the probability of a sentence directly. We had to chop it with the mark of approximation that the word given the previous word or given the previous two words. Here you also have to chop it into uh, um, smaller steps. So for example, you probably have never seen 
this sentence before, Batman did not fight any cat woman, so we cannot know how to translate it into, into Russian as a fool. So if we have seen it before, then you can like get it directly. So we need to, to, to break this into small steps. So that's what we do here. And basically, those are the IBM models. This, those are the first statistical models for machine translation. Those are word-based. And basically, the idea is that uh, this is a generative model that explains how an English sentence becomes Russian in this particular case. So in the first step, you decide um, which, how many Russian words will, be, uh, um, will correspond to a particular English word. So for example, here, fight, you have like two Russian words corresponding to, to fight. And if you go all down, it's uh, well boy. Um, so some words disappear, like did, and so on. Um, on the next step, there are words that you cannot explain with English that are just Russian specific, that are kind of I I inserted there. And there's some probability for this, because this S comes out of nowhere. And on the next step, you translate every word word for word. And finally, in the final step, you rearrange something so that you come up with Batman uh, and all these operations if you have if you have uh, word alignment something that tells you okay do those are the English words those are the, the the Russian words and if you if you have a direct correspondence for each word if you know what word is its translation between the two languages you can automatically learn those probabilities the problem is that you don't have them so what you do is you do expectation maximization and you try to guess this from the training data. So, um, okay, you learn this from a bytext and uh, you train this on many sentences and basically all the way up to um, the entire web. So first uh, you need to align uh, say English and Russian at the document level, then at the paragraph level, then the sentence level, and finally at the word level. And actually, this is the, the interesting part, the word level. So you start with, so for example, suppose that you have here красивые цветы in one sentence and beautiful flowers in, an, you know, in the English part. And here we have like красивые красные цветы and beautiful red flowers in another one, красивые девушки, uh, beautiful girls in another one. Um, so, um, looking at beautiful, you can say, okay, I mean, it can be that beautiful is translation of красивые uh, or it can be of цветы, beca because I see here again красивые and цветы in the same sentence, and here I also have красивые and цветы in the same sentence as beautiful. But then looking at, at here, um, you can start like a giving more, more probability to, to, s to some of those. And basically you do a few iterations, and at the end of the day you, en you end up with such kinds of word alignments. Those are the correspondences, which word corresponds to what. <coughs> so, of course, this doesn't work very well for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, what people use now is uh, phrase-based machine translation systems. There are others. There are syntactical, they move into semantics and so on. But this is state of the art. This is what Google uses. This is probably what Yandex uses. This is what you know most systems use for in general. So, <coughs> it's a simple model. So the idea is it has three steps. The first step is, okay, you start with an English sentence, you chop it into phrases. Those phrases are just like sequences of words. They don't have to be linguistic units. Then you translate each phrase in isolation, and finally you reorder the phrases. So here you have Batman, is translated as a phrase as Batman has not fought, as не сражался с, and so on. And, and, and finally you rearrange so that, you know, this yet, you know, becomes Paka at the second position and so on. That's the model. And what is good now is that you, um, inside a phrase, you have grammatical things. So you have like a gender agreement, maybe case agreement, uh, and, and, and you know, you can model the context better, you can do some kind of local disambiguation. It's much better than word for word. Um, so I want to give you some examples. Um, Okay, I have some Bulgarian English phrases, but uh, you should get the idea, even though you probably don't speak Bulgarian, <coughs> but it's similar to Russian. So, for example, here is Guavni, this word, and, you know, um, in those cases here, you have, this is translated as chief, chief prosecutor, chief accountants, but here, Guavni Stavu, Guavni Ulici, he is main. Sorry. See? 
And here, главният метод е senior instructors and главно предизвикателство major challenge. So you see that in the, in the, at the level of the phrases, this allows you to change uh, to, to, you know, if you, if you learn those kinds of phrases, you can generate more fluent translations because if you go word for word, it's hard to figure out how you should translate главни because they are different things, right? And then you also have like good agreement. A another problem is that uh, here this is plural and this is plural. But in English only this is plural, this is singular. So if you don't have phrase, if you have individual words, you can start like mixing plural with singular and so on. Or you can start mixing genders, say like senior uh, talk, for example, I, I, I things like that, that are not grammatical. And, and, and then of course, th this is much more powerful. So here I have uh, the, the word kaktu, which is the Russian kak. I, so I have like kak, kaktu, blah, blah, tak, kak, fizyczyska, tak i psychiczyska. Here you have bot in English, uh, and then you have cacto, like, here you have as, as well as, uh, in line with, and. So you see how you can generate much, much more powerful and much more fluent things with, with phrases. And then I have some uh, Russian Bulgarian examples. Um, so here you have Zayavlenie. Okay, here you have, you see that uh, you start like learning the different kinds of inflection, Morovoch, Zvanka, Zvanki, Zvankov, and how it corresponds to Bulgarians. Um, okay, so how do you evaluate machine translation? Uh, what people, I mean, what many people think is that, uh, well, what you do is, I mean, that a good way, many, many people believe that a good way to translate, to, to evaluate a machine translation system is, okay, I take a sentence in, in English, I translate it to Russian, then I translate it back to English, and I can compare the two, and I see how far I have departed from the original English, okay? Does, I mean, sounds reasonable, and there are like anecdotes about that, what happened. This is not true, but, you know, there are jokes about this. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is from the Bible, right? When you translate it to English, it has to Russian, it has to come with something like duch bodr nupot slaba, something like that, right? And, uh, you know, when the translation was back to English, it got the vodka is Buddha, the meat is rotten. <laughs> <laughs> And that's, that's not true. Um, anyway, uh, the reason people don't use this is because it's very easy to cheat it, okay? Oh, you want to be perfect, then you don't translate anything, right? Because you take the English, you keep the English as Russian, you say, I have translated it. Then you say, okay, translate it back. Okay, here it is. And then you get perfect, perfectly the your input. So this is not a good way to, to measure the, the quality of translation. So what people do instead is, uh, they try, they look at human translations of a sentence and they try to find out, to, to measure the similarity between the uh, computer translation and the human translation. So, and this similarity is based on word overlaps or sequences of two words, three words, four words. This is the blue, one of the most popular measures that is, has been established in 2002 and is still the de facto standard, even though this is an active field of research. And of course, looking at, it's, it's very hard to game it um, and correlates very well with human judgments. And of course, one human translation might not be enough. So typically when you evaluate, we evaluate with respect to multiple translations, like three or four or sometimes 16 and so on. Okay, um, yeah, okay, I'll skip this about parameter tuning. Um, and that was the first part. Any questions so far? Yes. Ну, конечно, да. Вы говорили здесь про статистическую, статическую machine translation, а есть еще просто machine translation, статистическая? Да. Или сейчас все переходы, они статистические? Нет, они, они не обязательно статистические. Есть, есть, скажем, там, Систран, у них э, система RU-based, э, основанная на правил. Там, там вообще как-то они 40 лет работали на, над этим, и у них очень-очень хорошие такие э, правила вручную. Я не знаю, там э, здесь, здесь в России были некоторые, в Болгарии были некоторые. Здесь, здесь, есть много, где как-то лингвистическое как ну, правила, которые как-то люди делают. Да, промп, да. Я, я, я хотел сказать о промпте, но я, я был не уверен, потому что я не знаю, как они работают. Но. Они, они как? Э, лингвистические, да? Да, да, не статистические. Но, но скажем, даже си стран э, сейчас они как-то э, пытаются комби комбинировать, комбинировать. Так что, да. Ну, по-моему, по -по 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 если, если э, у нас есть лингвистическое знание, э, 
надо использовать, нельзя вот так сбрасывать. Но, но я сейчас говорю, скажем, ну, то, что красиво математически и так далее. Так. Можно еще один вопрос? Да. Вот хотел уточнить, вы говорили о том, что syntax-based machine translation ну, имеет слабое распространение. То есть наиболее распространенный способ использования machine translation это phrase-based, грубо говоря. Вот, основная причина для этого это недостаток параллельных данных или в чем как бы, основная причина того, что syntax-based translation? А, 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 Синтактическое, это, это зависит от языка. Вот, скажем, если, если перевод между английский и китайский, там, там то, что трудно, это именно, э, значит, соварет. Со это как-то ред, э, это, это, ну, э, там, та, там, 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 скажем, вот, word order, да, да, вот, э, очередь слов, очень Поряд, разные. Слов. Да, перестановки, да, спасибо. Вот, видите, почему я говорю по-английски, да? Вот. Да, это, это, это очень, очень по-разному там. И вот это, это очень хорошо как-то моделировать синтактически там, потому что вот эти перемещения очень далеко. Вот если как-то, скажем, ну, скажем, если там глагол нужно как-то, и вот там много нужно перемести. А если только локально там что-то переместим, скажем, между английским и французским, ну, скажем, французский обычно э, прилагательное следует существительному, да? А в русский, скажем, это, это прилагательное существительное. Это, это не очень трудно. Это как-то локальное, это вот фразы достаточно. Это, это именно вот, вот поэтому, скажем, когда, когда перевод между китайским и английским, между языками, где как-то синтаксическая структура очень, очень различная, тогда, когда используются обычно синтаксические модели, они работают лучше. Но когда как-то это близкие родственные языки, Тогда вот как-то ну, структура предложения почти та же самая, как-то порядок слов вот, очень похож, тогда вот они очень-очень сильные. Вот поэтому не надо. Да. Здесь еще такая область, другая, не знаю, похожа или не очень, как суммаризация текстов. Вот, а там бывают такие метрики, как роже метрика. Вот еще есть у Ани Ненкова пирамидальная метрика. А вот применимы ли они для машинного перевода или нет? Интересно. Ну, вот э, руж — это, 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 собственно, что-то похоже на блю. Так что вот руж и блю как-то, ну, Немножко разные, но не так уж разные, как-то, скажем, вот там формулы немножко разные, но, но, но все равно они, равно они очень похожи. Да, пирамидальный метод — это другой. Вот там как-то, скажем, если есть там сам, резюме текста, да, и вот там это сравнивается, сравнивается, скажем, нужно найти эти 4 или 5 фактов включить там в резюме и, и как-то ну э, там ли факты или нет но это как-то скажем синтез, семантического уровня как-то немножко другая другая задача но есть но ну, есть э, метрики э, э, оценки качества перевода, которые пытаются использовать семантики, которые пытаются использовать дискорс, которые пытаются использовать синтакс, семантические роли и так далее и так далее Но, но пирамидальный метод, он, он как-то вот, вот так прямо не, не приложим для машинного перевода. Да. Ну хорошо, сейчас я <coughs> пойду... <coughs> Sorry. Now I'm passing to the second part of the talk. That's the main part. By the way, if you have uh, questions, you can uh, you know, ask during the talk. <coughs> Because it's long, there are made, a lot of material, but if you wait until the very end, You might forget. <coughs> okay, so this is about about the special case when you want to translate between um, you know, closely related languages. Um, so, okay. 
uh, as I have said, statistical machine translation systems, they, they need large uh, bilingual resources. Uh, they, they need large translations, say, between English and Russian. And the thing is that you can find those for many language pairs, but um, for many you don't. And uh, the idea is like to adapt resources for a resource-rich language to help machine translation for a resource-poor language. And I'll give you examples. So, okay. Right now, there are tools to build machine translation systems, tools like Moses, there are others like CDEC, uh, Joshua, and so on. And um, if you take uh, a, a tool like that, and you just give it parallel texts, like uh, that are sentence aligned, and you can also download some of those, then you can build a, a machine translation system in just hours, or if you have a little bit more data, maybe in a few days. And that's it. The thing is, okay, that's in theory. And in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, and in practice, there is. So in practice, what you need is you need a large byte text. And the thing is that they are not largely available. Where the large byte text come from? One big source for Google and, and for many others are the uh, United Nations resolutions and all kinds of documents that are released there in several languages. And there are like six official languages there. So those are all resource-rich languages for machine translation systems. Between those six, in all directions, you can build strong machine translation systems because of that. Then recently, you have the European Union. It has, uh, you know, over 20 official languages. Same thing, all these documents, everything is translated between them. So, um, and, and, and some other languages are also kind of rich in resources. But the thing is that, you know, there are like, who knows, something between five and 10,000 languages in the earth, and they are disappearing fast. And uh, most of them are resource poor. So, um, and actually, Okay, now I'm talking about languages, but if you have, if you look at machine translation, we are talking there about language pairs. So even if, uh, say, um, you know, um, maybe Bulgarian is resource rich because it's in the European Union, right? So we have all this uh, uh, documentation. Chinese is resource rich because it's in the United Nations, right? If you want to build the systems between Chinese and Bulgarian, it's not so rich anymore because they are not direct, right? There's not much translation between Chinese and, and, and Bulgarian directly, or between Chinese, uh, between Chinese and Russian days because of the UN. So, and if you look at word pairs, this number is even much more striking. And then, um, even resource-rich languages are resource-poor in particular domains. So you might have a lot of United Nations data between, say, Chinese and Russian, but if you want to go in the biomedical domain or, or history or something like that, you know, then maybe there might be not so much. So, um, and yeah, this is just a Zipfian distribution of resources. Well, maybe you can still build. I mean, like some small bytex you can probably find somewhere or you can like pay somebody to do uh, something small. But uh, large are hard to get. I mean, um, okay, I have the European Union. Um, okay, one easy recipe to get uh, resource rich is to get to become an official uh, language of the European Union or of the United Nations or so on. Not all languages are so lucky, but many can benefit with some of the techniques that I'm going to present to you. So, <coughs> something that I want to mention here, and this is different from what I'm going to present. I'm going to come back to this, but um, how do you translate, say, from Russian to Malay, right? And this is what Google does a lot and probably Yandex too. So what you do is you do triangulation. Uh, you translate from Russian to English and then from English to Malay. And you can do this directly as a two-step, right? You take a Russian sentence, uh, you translate it to English, and then you translate this, this English uh, sentence to Malay. Or if you look at those phrases, right? You can do this kind of triangulation or pivoting at the phrase level. So, for example, if you have like Ramashne Saglashenie is translated as framework agreement in English, then Parjanjian uh, Karanga Karja is, you know, in Malay is translated as framework agreement in English with some probabilities. Then you can, you know, induce from there that Ramashne Saglashenie and Parjanjian Karanga Karja are translations of each other with some probability that you can, you know, induce from from the phrase tables. And then you directly you take one phrase table between um, Russian and English and another one between um, English and Malay, and then you construct on the fly uh, you know, a new phrase table uh, to translate directly between Russian and, and Malay, right? Um, 
So this is not what, what, what uh, you know, that, that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but initially I'm going to talk about something else. Um, so, and this is, suppose that you want to translate into English, right? And you, and you have like, uh, so, so the idea is you have Indonesian English and you have very little data for it, but you have a lot of Malay English data. Or if you want, suppose that you have a lot of Russian English data, but very little, say, Ukrainian English data. And now the question is, can you use, say, Russian English data to, to help Ukrainian English translation, for example, right? And here, in these experiments, it's going to be, I have a little bit of Indonesian English, a lot of Malay English. The question is, can I make use of this Malay English because Malay and Indonesian are closely related to improve Indonesian English translation? And this is different from the triangulation uh, in this kind of uh, pivoting, where the task here is to translate from Indonesian to Malay, pivoting over English. Our task is to translate from Indonesian to English. Um, and here's another scenario where you translate from Indonesian to Malay and then to English. Um, but in this case, you presuppose that you have Indonesian Malay data and Malay English data. But in our case, we suppose that you have Indonesian English and Malay English. So this is our scenario. <coughs> so <coughs> this is a scenario that, uh, you know, in Europe applies in many cases. So if you look at uh, different kinds of languages, say the Germanic languages, say German is resource rich. Okay, I'm not talking about English. But, you know, Irish, Breton, and so on are <coughs> not so much. Or, or um, here Sp Spanish and French and Italian are relatively rich, but Catalan and Occitan, not so much. And, and similar kind of thing between the, the uh, Slavic languages and so on. So the, the task is to take one of those that are resource poor and use resources from some related resource rich language to improve the translation. And yeah, so here are different kinds of examples between uh, of related languages. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples between Bulgarian, Macedonian, Malay, uh, uh, Indonesian, and, 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 and some others. Um, so why would this work? Well, it's because uh, related languages have some overlapping vocabulary. They have cognates, and they have similar word order, they have similar syntax. And here I have some examples between Macedonian and Bulgarian. So you don't have to speak Macedonian or Bulgarian to see that, uh, you know, you have a lot of overlap. Znam, znam, si, si, koi, koi, sushnust, sushnust, and so on, right? And, and of course, sometimes you have a little bit more diversion, but, you know, this tells you that there is something that, that, you, that you can exploit. Okay, so we are, I'm going now going to talk about Indonesian English translation using, this is the resource poor language pair, using Malay English. <coughs> to give you uh, some idea about Malay and Indonesian. So Malay and Indonesian are very closely related languages. Um, so Malay is spoken in Malaysia, uh, in Brunei, in Singapore, and Indonesian is spoken in Indonesia, but actually any textbook about Malay or about Indonesian is going to claim that they are basically the same language. But then if you, if you take a native speaker of Indonesian or of Malay to read a newspaper, he's going to to find out a couple of unknown words or words uh, that probably he can guess what these words mean, but they have a, a wrong usage or something like that. In pretty much every sentence, they are going like to be like two or three of those at least. And actually here I have a translation of Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Malay and Indonesian. Those are the official translations. And you can see that there is only about 50% word overlap. Of course, part of this is translation sh translator's choice, right? And, and uh, the actual overlap is higher. So for example, uh, Dari means from, it exists in both languages. Dengan means with, it also exists in, in, in both languages. Manusia means human, it exists in both. Orang means a man, it also exists in both, and so on and so forth. And um, so we have asked uh, an Indonesian speaker to look at the Malay sentence and try to adapt it to look, uh, you know, to post edited to look in uh, Indonesian as much as possible. And when you do that, right, you find out that the actual overlap is about 75%, okay? Which means that, I mean, this is kind of eliminating the, the translator's bias, right? This tells you actually how similar they are, at least with respect to this. And what I'm going to talk about is how to try to do this kind of adaptation automatically, okay? So the idea is that, okay, you want to translate Indonesian English, and we have Malay English data. Can we adapt a little bit this Malay to look more like Indonesian 
and then we can train a machine translation system on that. So this is the scenario. <coughs> we have Indonesian English, that's resource poor, a language pair, Malay English, that's resource rich. So what we do is we translate this Malay into something that looks like Indonesian, right? <coughs> and finally, we combine this Indonesian and the Indonesian that comes from Malay, and, and we uh, build a system to translate from Indonesian to English using bots. The good and, and kind of the small good Indonesian data and the big uh, but potentially noisy data that we have generated. And I mean, <coughs> what I want to stress again, we don't suppose that we have Indonesian Malay data, right? So how do we adapt Malay English to look like Indonesian English? So um, we start with a Malay sentence. We, do, uh, we use word level paraphrases, phrase level paraphrases, and cross lingual morphology. I'm going to, ex to explain what this means. Um, and after we do the adaptation, then we pair the newly generated Indonesian English with the original English translation. So we take a Malay English pair and we just manipulate the Malay side to look it to make it look more, more like Indonesian, and then we pair it with the same English translation, and now we generate a new <coughs> kind of Indonesian-English sentence pair. And this is training data that you can use to train a machine translation system. <laughs> so it turns out that, you know, from the previous examples, from the analysis, that in many cases, word-for-word -word substitution is enough. So here you have an example, Kedin Kamalaysia, Dijan Gachicha, La Pan Paratus, Parataun, Dua Ribu, Sepulu. And here we have paratus, here we have percent. Um, paratus means per hundred, and here is percent, right? It's just, uh, uh, and, and here we have, again, like, y you can explain this as word-for-word -word translations, right? And the word order doesn't change. You don't need any swapping of words, dropping words, inserting new words, splitting words, and so on. In some cases, you do. In some cases, you don't. And suppose it, that all we need to do is we need to go and substitute some words with another word from, from the other language. Because you have Malay, and there it's, it's kind of Indonesian, but now and there, there are some words that don't sound quite right, and you want to propose new, new versions for them. Um, <coughs> so what we do is, we suppose that we have those versions from somewhere. So we build a lattice. So uh, this is not visible, but it's not supposed to be visible. So we have like um, different versions for the for this word, different versions for this word, different versions for this word, and of course you have multiple of those, and they all come with probabilities. And um, then you use a language model to tell you to choose the best path, taking the whole sentence into account. In this what is, it's it's a graph where you have probabilities, and you want something that that kind of has the highest probability of being uh, a good. Uh, Indonesian sentence over this path, and then you take the, the top 10, for example, and you pair each of them, okay, you take the top 10, and you ta pair each of them with the same English translation, and you use this as training data. Of course, you can take the top one, but the thing is that in this path, you can make a mistake, so you want, you know, to, to, have, to have more uh, coverage. So as a result, we generate a new Indonesian kind, kind of Indonesian English by text from the Malay English by text. So where are these options coming from for, the <coughs> for those words that don't, you know, for those Malay words that are not quite Indonesian? <coughs> so we can do word level pivoting. This is a popular technique. So the idea is, okay, you look at the Malay English by text, and over there, you do with the IBM models they have shown you, you generate automatic word alignments. Okay, Malay, the first Malay word is translated with the, you know, we have a sentence here, you have an English sentence here, and you have correspondence between the words. And you have this Malay word is translated as this English word. And then you look at the Indonesian English by text, and then you see that this same English word is translated with some other Indonesian word. And then from here, you can make the connection that maybe this Malay word is translated as this Indonesian word with some probability. 
how can you calculate this probability? <coughs> Under some independence assumptions, you can just you know do it with this summation. So it's the probability sum over all possible English words of uh, the Indonesian word given the English word times the English word given the Malay word. And and you end up with you know uh, list of translation options with some probabilities. And this is what you can put here in this uh, in this what is okay. And then you have the language model that tells you how much it likes, you know, that tries to, to get the best path. Okay, so there, there are several issues with this. The first issue is that um, we have the assumption that the Indonesian English data is little. The Malay English is a lot, right? But the Indonesian English is, is little. So, um, and because it's little, the word alignments that we learn correspondence between the Malay and English, uh, between Indonesian and English, is not very reliable. It's not very reliable because you don't have enough training data. So you don't have enough trans uh, transformations. So what you can do is like, uh, basically, um, I'll, I'll describe this te technique a little bit later, but basically you can uh, generate better word alignments using the Malay data. So you just take, um, you repeat several times the Indonesian English data and you add the Malay English data to it and you learn word alignments from that. And then you throw away the, the the extra data and and you get improved word alignments um, this works because there are many cognates between malay and Indonesian. there are many words that are common between the two languages <coughs> then um this the okay because the indonesian english bytex is small this this is another problem um the problem is that okay you are learning correspondences between Malay and Indonesian, but if the Indonesian in Indonesian you have little text, this means that you have a small vocabulary. You have very few words. So you try to map Malay words. Suppose that you have like 10 times more text in Malay. And suppose, suppose that you have like 10 times more words in, in the vocabulary of Malay, and you have you know, 10 times less in Indonesian. Now, for the unknown words in Malay, you try to map them into a small number of Indonesian words, and this doesn't work very well because it's just that in your Indonesian English bytex, you don't have enough good candidates there because you just have very little data. This is just a matter of vocabulary. So what we do is you we try to extend this by generating uh, cross-lingual morphological variants. So this works like that. So suppose you have a word, Malay word, um, and then you go to morphology and you come to the stem of the word, that's minum, which means to drink. And and um, minum minum is drinks uh, and, and so on. Minuman is is uh, a drink. Minum is to drink. Terminum is like drink by mistake and so on. Um, basically, what we do is we start with Malay word. You go to the uh, to, to, to to the Malay lemma, and then you go and you find all Indonesian words in the monolingual Indonesian text, which is bigger than the bytex. Remember that the language model is trained on, on parallel data while the the mono the lang uh, okay the translation model is trained on parallel data but the language model on monolingual data so you can get much more of, of a monolingual Indonesian text and and we find from there all words that can have this kind of the same lemma and we generate those as potential translation candidates and we assign them probability in some way the third problem is that um, we do the pivoting at the word level, which means that you cannot drop uh, uh, words, we cannot insert, you cannot merge, you cannot split, we cannot reorder, and so on. Um, one way out of this is like to do this pivoting, not at the word level, but at the phrase level. And we have seen before with the phrase-based translation that phrases can capture a lot of local reordering and things, and many of those things can be captured. And, and uh, you know, this works quite well. <coughs> so, the second step is, how do we combine the original Indonesian English and the adapted Indonesian English by text? Uh, one way is like we can just simply combine them, concatenate them. Um, we can do uh, balanced concatenation, or we can do something a little bit uh, smarter. So um, if you concatenate the by text, if you just concatenate the, the Indonesian English and the Malay English, what happens? Um, Sorry, and, and, and the adapted 
Malay English. The thing is that the adapted text is not necessarily of the same quality, but it's much bigger. And if we combine them, we com we the small data that is really good is going to be dominated by the large data that is potentially noisy. Because it's in another language, we have adapted it a little bit, but it's not as good. So we are going to get improved word alignments because of some rare words. Uh, you are going to get more translation options um, um, and some good phrases. But the problem is that the, the out of you know the, the, the second one is going to gem generate because it's larger and, and the translation probabilities are going to be messed up. And, and because you cannot distinguish for a particular phrase pair where it came from the Malay English or the original Malay Indonesian English or from the adapted Indonesian English. Um, you can do balanced concatenation. Y you can remedy for this. You can say, okay, I'm going to take the, the original Indonesian English, I'm going to repeat it enough times so that I have, uh, you know, so that its size is about the same size as the synthetic one that I have generated. And, and you, can, you can combine, you can do it in this way. And you can also fr uh, merge phrase tables. I'm going, this doesn't work quite well. I'm going to skip it. Um, and then you can do something a little bit smarter, which uh, improves the word alignments. And um, OK, I'll skip that um, and get you to something more interesting, the experiments. <coughs> so um, we experiment with about um, 1 million Indonesian English data and about 9 million Malay English additional data. So to build a good machine translation system, you, you need about 10 million words. Okay, so for Malay English, we have kind of quite enough uh, data, and, and, and actually, if you, if you train a system on this data, and if you compare it to Google, I mean, sometimes you cannot tell the diff you know, you cannot tell which one is, is better. But for Indonesian English, this is not the case. So, <coughs> here are some results. Of course, Malay and Indonesian are, are very close languages. If you just train a system on Malay English data and test on Indonesian English, this is the blue score that you get. If you train on the, this is 10 times bigger than the Indonesian English data. If you, tra if you train on Indonesian English, right, and you test on Indonesian English, of course you get hi higher blue. So how do you interpret the blue, s the blue scores? Roughly, if you have a f uh, difference of two, three points in blue, uh, this is something that is visible to humans. Okay, so, so uh, this is, I mean, when there is one blue point that's strong enough to publish a paper in the best conferences, but it's not something that people are necessarily going to see. If the difference is about two, three blue points, this is something that is clearly visible to humans. Okay? So here, okay. <coughs> of course, Malay and Indonesian are not the same languages. If you train on Malay and you test on Indonesian, I mean, you are much worse, even though you train on 10 times more data than this. But now if you take this Malay data and you do the simple word level adaptation, and to train a system on this, you get this blue, which is better than training on the, in th on the original Indonesian data. Um, if you also apply morphology, you get some further boost. If you do the adaptation, not at the word, but the, at the phrase level, you get this blue. If you do also morphology at the phrase level, you get this. And if you combine uh, these uh, ways to do system combination between the word level paraphrases with morphology and phrase level paraphrases with morphology, you end up with this blue. Right? And this is, so we take this 14 and you bring it to 21. Okay? This is so far not really using the Indonesian English data for training, just for the process of adaptation. Right? So we have made the, a system trained on Malay where you have translated, made Malay to look a little bit more like Indonesian, you know, be much stronger than a system trained on Indonesian English. And here we have like about three blue points of improvement which should be visible to humans. Of course, we have, um, because we have Indonesian, I mean, here in all these blue things, it's only trained on the adapted Malay to in Indonesian I system, but uh, data. But there's no reason to ignore this original good Indonesian English data. And um, so <coughs> here are the different kinds of, of, of combining the two. So if you, tra if you combine directly the original Malay English and in, in the Indonesian English data without adaptation, if you just concatenate the byte text, this is what we get. If you do balanced concatenation with these repetitions that I have told you about, this is what you get. And the little bit more sophisticated method that I didn't tell you about much, 
this is what you get, it's a little bit better. But then if you adapt Malay to look like Indonesian, then it doesn't really matter how you combine them. You can just, because it turns out that it's, it's already quite good, so you can just add the two together, and this is what you get. <coughs> so this is kind of a summary of, of, of the method. So we start, okay, here's what you get with Malay English, with Indonesian English. This is if you combine those two together, this is what you get, and this is also if you do adaptation, you get a little bit further. And here I have similar results for uh, <coughs> um, Macedonian English translation using Bulgarian to, to, to get a little bit better. So some analysis I have. Um, in the pivoting, do you want to pivot only the words, only the Malay words that don't exist in Indonesian? Not really. So if you, if you do that, this is what you get. Um, or maybe you want to do words that are rare, for which you are not so sure in the translation, maybe words that happen less than 10 times or less than 20 or less than 40 times. And you see that when you do that, because the thing is, you can have false friends. So, um, for example, gift. Gift in German means poison, right? But gift in English is gift, right? And, and between closely related languages, you have a lot of those false friends. So it's dangerous. That's why it turns out that it's good to try to paraphrase every single thing. But in these paraphrases, you always keep the original option there in the lattice. So it, it has the chance to be selected and to be preserved. Um, see, here have some human judgments. This actually tells us that, that uh, the options that we generate are not necessarily good from a human viewpoint. There is a lot of noise there, but there is also a lot that the machine translation system can learn from, the, from this, and eventually you win. And uh, here I have something else going in the other direction. Um, so, okay, I'll skip this one. Um, you can you can also work. You, you can so far we have done the adaptation at the word level, at, at the phrase level, and with this cross linguistic morphology. But um, um, you can do this in a better way. So you can kind of um, write a specialized decoder that um, uh, tries to do this kind of transformation for you. Actually, this is, this is quite effective if you want to normalize Twitter. Um, so for example, you start with something like this, where you, and then you have dictionary operations that map this you to you. Um, and then you have a tree of different kinds of options that you search. And you transform this into where you, and then again, this word into where, where you, and then you kind of insert the verb to be, and then you insert punctuation, and you start, end up with where are you, right? And actually, what we have done before, I mean, before we have been doing the word level mapping, the phrase level mapping, the cross lingual morphology, all this kind of separately. You can combine this in, in, in a better way with this kind of, of, of decoder with and, and, and actually do the search um, at this level. And this actually, you know, using those kinds of, of, of uh, hypothesis producers. Hypothesis producer is something that gets you from one state in the tree into another one, and you can get better results. So why is that? Well, because the decoding that we have been working before works at the word level or the phrase level, and here the transformation is at the entire sentence level. So it takes an entire sentence and tries to to find another sentence that is better. Um, and then you have um, the cross-lingual variants here where in the input what is here, it's, it's a feature function, and, and, and uh, you know, you have the potential to use uh, manual rules and so on. Anyway, there are details about this decoder. I don't have much time to go into it. I'm just going to show you the, re the results that, you know, when you do this kind of, of, of decoder, it's better than the previous one which just uses machine translation systems to do the adaptation. <coughs> okay, and also for Macedonian English. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to something uh, a little bit um, different but related. I mean, so far we have been talking about uh, Malay, Indonesian, and, and, and um, yeah, Malay English and Indonesian English. Here we, we talk about Spanish and Portuguese. So we know that Spanish and Portuguese are another pair of related languages. And again, this is the, uh, the declaration of, of human rights. If you look at the exact word overlap, it's uh, strikingly low. I mean, 
the, the vocabulary, of the actual vocabulary overlap between English and uh, 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 Spanish and Portuguese is about 90 percent. This is what linguists say. But here we see only 17 percent. Okay? And um, here, instead of going to asking to a human to go and to do some kind of post-editing and all that, what we did is I just like, you know, um, recognized as much as also words that are a little bit different. So, for example, you have los, os, nasin libres, nasim livres, iguales in dignidad, iguais in dignidad, in direitos, and so on. So, you have, I mean, those are simple transliterations, and you should be able to get many of those automatically. So, basically, you can get from 17 to 67 percent with just transliterations at the word level. And um, and this is because of cognates, right? Razon and razon are cognates, consciencia and consciencia, devem and devem, and so on. And this is something that, that you can see. Some of these are systematic, you can learn them. Some of these are rare, and you cannot. So what are cognates? In linguistics, cognates are words that are derived from a common root. So for example, the Latin tu, and the French tu, and Spanish su, and so on, the German du, uh, Old English tau, they are all derived from the same Indo-European word. And whether, whether the words are orthographically, phonetically, or semantically related doesn't matter. What matters is the origin. In computational, uh, so for example, you can have a lot of difference between cognates. So you have, for example, night, nacht, nuit, notte, noite. So you see that, okay, here you can probably tell it, but star, estrella, stella, etoile, okay, maybe you can, but here you have father and pair, head and chef. If you look historically, you can find that those are cognates. They have the same origin. You can trace them to the same original word, but it start like diverging. Or here you have arbeit, rabota, robota, rabota. Um, so you have like, you see that if you look at the consonant, you can see the origin. In computational linguistics, um, the definition of cognates is something that, that uh, has similar or ortho uh, orthography and, and uh, similar semantics, but whether they are of the same origin doesn't matter. So you have evolution, uh, evolution, evolution, evolução, evolutione, and so on. Some of these are systematic and easy to learn. Um, senor, senor, this is just about spelling, uh, or you can have something about phonetics. Visite, visitei, visito, visito, and so on. Um, some of those are rare and, and kind of vocational data and, and only uh, refer to a particular word, like Mario, Mario, Maria, Maria, um, Desir, Desir. Um, this is something that applies to one word only, and maybe you can learn it, maybe you cannot. But those are systematic, and you can learn them automatically. And basically, the idea is that you can go and you can learn these kind of cognates. I'm going to skip how you do that. That's simple. And then if you do this kind of automatic transliteration of the text, what do you get? So here you want to trans translate Spanish-English using Portuguese-English data. So if you just say, OK, Portuguese and Spanish are similar, let me train on Portuguese-English and test on Spanish-English, this is what you get, a blue of five. If you do the automatic transliteration of the Portuguese to look like Spanish, you get a blue of 13, okay, which is a big jump. Um, if you train just on the Spanish data, you get a 22, right? And if you combine the, the, you know, if you combine this one, the original Portuguese and the original Spanish, you get this 24. But if you tra combine the transliterated Portuguese and the original Spanish together, and you train on this, you get 26, which is much better. So in this case, you know, we just did it with transliteration. In the previous case with, ma with Malay and, 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 uh, Indone and, and Indonesian, we didn't do it transliteration because those are, Malay, Malay is a weird kind of language. It has no inflectional morphology. So from that point of view, it's like Chinese. There is no past tense. I mean, there is no, uh, you know, gender, number. There is no plural. I mean, all these kind of things don't exist. But it's, it's morphologically complex. It's derivational. So you can, like, have all kinds of verbs like um, you have in Russian you have prigut, prignut, but prignut, it, uh, and so on. I mean, it has a lot of those, but doesn't really have yeah, prigut, prigut, on prigut. No, it's just one, just like in English, you have jump. I mean, I jump, we jump, it doesn't really change. Okay, the last thing I want to tell you. Um, from, from this part is about um, 
um, trust iteration versus character. Uh, an another technique that you, that you can apply between uh, closely related languages is character level translation. So going back to Macedonian and Bulgarian, you can say, okay, um, maybe um, you know you see that that a lot of, of those differences are small, and you can you can hope to learn them at the character level. So the idea is that you don't translate with words; we just translate with characters. You say that every character, every letter, is actually a word, and you build a model on that. Um, <coughs> Here I have some results. So if you're translating, we want to translate Macedonian. Um, so uh, with cognates and transliteration, this like word level translation uh, and so on. Um, and, and um, okay, I'll skip this slide. Um, I'll just show you the, the kinds of rules that, that you learn. So you learn things that are, you know, you learn like good prefixes and suffixes you kind of that something like afme, ahme. This is how, how the uh, verb ending ends. You still have translation of words, entire words. This is the space. Uh, you have still some phrases and you have combinations of those, like uh, verb suffix and, and, and some uh, particle. So is it better to translate with words or with characters between closely related languages, like between Macedonian and Bulgarian? <coughs> So this is translation with characters, and this is translation with words, and this is blue. So you see that when you have little training data, it's better to translate with words. When you have more training uh, with characters, when you start having more data, it's better to generalize at the word level. Of course, all, words, uh, all languages are not similar. So I have the Slavic languages of Europe here, and uh, you probably know that there are like three major groups of Slavic languages. There are Eastern Slavic languages, there are Western, and there are Southern. And, and you know, the languages within each of those groups are more similar to each other than between those groups. And um, so here we look at Macedonian, and we try to, you know, you see what happens when we use Bulgarian or Serbian or, or, or uh, Slovenian. Those are you know, from the same old tree, from the same are South Slavic. This is Western Slavic. Um, and those are geographically neighbors of Macedonian. By the way, uh, in Bulgaria, uh, officially, um, officially Bulgaria, the Bulgarian government and the official policy of Bulgaria is to believe that Macedonian is just a dialect of Bulgarian. It's not a separate language and so on. So it's something similar to you know, what people believe between Macedonia and, 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 and uh, sorry, between Malay and Tunisian, but it's a political question and, and what's the dialect, what's the, what's the language, there's no good linguistic definition, it's just a note. And Slovenian, which is a little bit further apart, and here we have Czech, which is from a different group. So again, looking at the character level translation, so if you use Serbian, right, you see that um, word level translation is starts getting better at some point, um, you know, as you get more data, uh, character level is better when you have less, uh, uh, and, and you know at some point it becomes worse. With Slovenian, which is further apart, <coughs> this point happens earlier, and we check, right? Almost from the beginning, it's better to go with words and, and less with, with characters, because you know the, the, the transformations that you have to make between the words are, are bigger. So you cannot capture this with just characters. <coughs> Finally, I want to go back to pivoting. So what was pivoting? Suppose that you want to translate between Macedonian and English. You say, I'm going to <coughs> turn Macedonian into Bulgarian. And then, because I, I have very little Macedonian data, and I have a lot of Bulgarian English data. Why? Because Bulgarian is in the European Union and has all these kind of resources. <coughs> Macedonian is not there yet, so it doesn't have them. Right? <coughs> That's the pivoting idea. Now, the thing is, OK, if I just, I have, uh, we have very little Macedonian English data. So if you translate from Macedonian to English with just this data, this is what we get. Um, if you translate first Macedonian to Bulgarian and then Bulgarian to English, this is what we get if you do it with the word level. And if you do it with the character level, because Macedonian and Bulgarian are very close, it works a little bit better. Um, and you know, this is how the tra translation between the for the second step, Bulgarian to English. <coughs> Sorry, this is, just this is just for the translation from Macedonian to Bulgarian, and this is uh, at the word at the character level. And then you take this Bulgarian result and you translate it to English, and this is the, trans the 
the quality of this sec the system for the second step. And the result is this. <coughs> so if you go M Bulgarian, word uh, Macedonian, word level translation to Bulgarian, and then to English, this is what you get. It's only a little bit better than just to translate directly Macedonian to English. But if you go with the character level translation between Macedonian and Bulgarian, right, and then this step, you get quite an improvement. Um <coughs> now it turns out that it's better to do synthetic to generate synthetic data. So instead of translating, um instead of taking the Macedonian input, translate it to Bulgarian and then translate this Bulgarian uh input to English, it turns out it is better to take Bulgarian trans from this big Bulgarian English data that you have for this high quality system and translate this Bulgarian to look like Macedonian, just like before we were doing with Malay English to look like Indonesian English, right? And to train a system on that. And if you do this, whether you do the adaptation at the word level or at the character level, um, it, it turns out to work better. So we have here we had. Uh, something like 25, and here over Bulgarian we have 26, 28, and then of course you can do it over different languages, over Bulgarian, Serbian, Slovenian, Czech. If you put all these together, you get a blue of 36, 69, and we start with 22, which is a very huge improvement of 14 blue points. Okay, just to conclude this part of the talk, um, I have talked to you about uh, adapting Bitex uh, for related resource rich languages. Uh, to look like resource poor using confusion networks, word level paraphrases, phrase level paraphrases, and cross lingual <laughs> morphology. I have also talked to you a little bit about character level translation, character level transliteration, pivoting, and the idea of synthetic data. And uh, in future work, you want to apply this to other languages, to other uh, natural language processing problems, and to see how this works with noisy data across domains and so on. And um, I can stop here. We can get some questions, or if you want to hear a little bit of uh, further thoughts about, uh, you know, machine translation that I have about why it's hard, where it's going, and so on, I have a few more slides on that as well. Any questions at this point? Yes. Извините, можно еще раз вот насчет вот этих, ну вот points вы их называли, то есть. То есть чем больше points, тем лучше получается система перевода. Да. Вот смысл одной, одна точка, это что такое? Это что-то, ну можно его сформулировать? Или это просто абстрактные некоторые? Это абстрактно, это абстрактно. А, и, 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 и вообще нельзя, нельзя, э, нельзя сравнивать, нельзя, вот. То, что я сказал, вот скажем, две-три точки на блю, это как-то что-то можно видеть. Конечно, это, это имеет значение, какая, какой базис. А, если, если у системы, скажем, машина перевод, э, скажем, между арабским и английским, когда там э, много, много э, человеческих э, переводов, там качество может быть 50-60%. Но тогда, скажем, 2-3, это, это не так уж много. Ну, а если уровень 14, там 2-3, это много, это большое подобное. А вот этот уровень базовый, он определяется большей частью объемом данных, правильно я понял? Извините? Вот этот уровень, там, 14 или 50, да. он определяется объемом данных из исходных? А, объем, объем данных, а, а, возможно, ну, качество перевода, еще, еще как-то а, сколько там человеческих переводов и так далее, и так далее. С, насколько, насколько длинные предложения, насколько mm -hmm. трудный текст и так далее. В, вот Blue а, имеет, а, мож, можно использовать, корректно использовать, только для, для сравнивая, сравнивая качество перевода систем, дет, э, которые, которые обучались на те же самые данные и которые как-то тест, тест тоже на те же самые данные. Вот, вот тогда можно сказать, вот это больше другое. Но, но сказать, вот у меня 20, у тебя 30, у тебя можно быть э, одни, одни данные, у меня могут быть другие и просто как-то нельзя, нельзя сравнивать. Понятно, спасибо. Вот. Я не знаю, хотите ли вы, чтобы я сказал вам еще немножко? Э, хотите? Хорошо. Нет, потому что, э, ну, может быть, усталый или надоело. Вот третья часть. 
Ah, okay. So the, the third part, um, why, okay, is about, I mean, I, I first want to tell you something about why machine translation is hard or why it's easy, when it's hard, when it's easy. Okay, why is it hard? Um, it's hard for a number of uh, for a number of reasons. One reason can be word order. I have mentioned this for Chinese, right? And here I can tell you something about the general word order. So, for example, in English we have typically have um, subject, verb, object. I want beer, right? Um, in Turkish, you have the verb at the end. So you have ben beer, bira is tiorum. So you have like you know, I beer want. That's the general word order, okay? And this is hard. This is hard for phrase-based systems because there can be a lot of material in the, I mean, this is not necessarily local. When the verb is at the end, there can be many, many words in between, and you cannot capture this easily. That's why you want syntactic systems, right? Um, you can have lexical ambiguity. Stirli stapiu pečku, čiris čas pečku tonova. What? Uh, so, so, and, 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 and actually this is, this is Okay, so, so and, and, and then this is, this is a problem, um, uh, by the way, a, a general problem of machine translation systems because the way that they work right now is that they um, work at the sentence level, which means that when they translate this sentence, they have no knowledge, they don't look at the previous sentences and other sentences and so on. And this is not what professional translators do. When a translator translates a text, what you know they do is they I mean, good translators would first read the whole thing to get an idea about what this is about, and then they're going to translate, right? To get some context. But I mean, currently machine translation systems work at the sentence level. So there's, there's actually a lot of uh, uh, recent research where people want to go beyond the sentence level, want to kind of take into account the context around. Um, but I mean, the results are not, not very strong and not very convincing, and this is not it's an important research direction, but it's not, uh, you know, common yet. Um, another, f another thing is um, pronoun resolution. Если ребенок не любит холодное молоко, сварите его. Кого будем варить, да? So, so uh, you know, in if if you if, if you if you have to translate this to English, right? Uh, you have to make a choice between it and him, right? In Russian, there is no choice, so you have this kind of ambiguity. Um, of course, you have you have all kinds of idioms, and this is what people normally talk about. Piotr prekazao dolga žit, Peter kicked the bucket. There is nothing, you know, that that, that is there, <coughs> and so on. Um, right, and, and 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 then you have you have different kinds of division of the world. So, for example, um, 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 you have, I mean, in. In in English, we have we have like one word for this part of your. I mean, okay. Well, po Russian, только рука. А по английски вот есть слово на разной части руки и так далее и так далее. Or so here is uh, ju just look at something like how to translate uh, much or many um, to Russian. So if okay, if the preceding word is how you say skolka. If the preceding word is as, so it's like as much, how much is skolka? As much is tolka že. Uh, just much is very, or, uh, and, and, and so on. Nogi, noga, nogi, noga. And, so, and you see how many cases and how many things you have. Uh, this is another thing that makes translation hard. Um, and then natural language is ambiguous. And, and you know, you really need some knowledge about the world to, to make the distinction. Minister accused of having eight wives in jail. So is he having the eight wives in jail, or is he is he in jail because of having eight wives? Wives. Well, let me show you some okay idioms, right? What is the nose, the chin, zuby, tak dali, tak dali. So it can be that, that the machine translation system doesn't know those. Or what what van Paul McCartney, da? And 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 this and this is a problem for machine translation because uh, often, right, uh, the machine translation systems first convert everything to lowercase. So Paul, как имя, там есть прописная буква, да? А вот Paul, 
как, как, как слово, такое, такое нет. Но, so, but, but the thing is that because of data sparseness issues, you don't want to have you know, those two separately. You, you want like, uh, yeah. So, so you, you convert everything to lower case to make the translation simple, to this decreases your vocabulary, because you don't want to have uh, um, chleb uh, with, with an uppercase and into lowercase as two separate words. It doesn't make sense. You want to, and, and then you have a problem. Y you have the same problem in English. You have us and US. US in uppercase and us when you convert everything to lowercase, so and have this causes a lot of problems. <coughs> so another problem, right, here in Russian, is the stress, right? But the computer, when you translate text, there is no stress. So you have Sabaka Sidit Uvarot, Urubahi Bul Vishid Vorot. Если я хорошо читаю, потому что у часов две стрелки, стрелки взяли ружья. Окей. За рекой было село, солнце село. Дети пили молоко, пили бревно. А, пили бревно ровно. So okay, so you see you know the, the difference. I mean, if you, if you have to translate this to English, you have to choose a different thing. And, and yeah. Um, <laughs> I, did, I didn't, 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 you know, I found this somewhere. I did not uh, put it there. <coughs> um, okay. So it's about what state and what legit. Okay. стоишь, что лежишь, что и так далее. Окей. Okay. And, 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 and you can imagine how hard it is for a computer to figure the out this, right? <coughs> and, and, and of course, you know, I can show you some more jokes about Stirlitz. Stretch your Gestapo words. Yes, more, and so on, and so Okay. <coughs> so when, wh when is machine translation easy? Um, it's easy for closely related languages, which have uh, similar word order, similar grammar, and so on. And um, it's also easy for legal texts that have a lot of cliches, a lot of standard language, a lot of repetitions. I mean, it's on purpose that you say the things in the same way because you don't want different interpretations. Um, it's also simple when the original language is simple. So this, this kind of so-called caterpillar English, this is what caterpillar started doing, Xerox is doing, and others. So basically, they have designed particular words how to write the user manuals. They said, okay, sentences, First of all, user manuals are easy to translate because click here, open here, you know, and, and, and things like that. It's not, it's not very complex language. And then they have designed further rules. They have found what is hard. So maybe very long sentences are hard. I mean, or these kinds of constructions are hard to translate and so on. They just say, don't use them, okay? And what happens is now you can translate almost without human intervention. They say that they don't use any intervention. They actually say that what we do is, okay, we write our manuals in English, we translate into all other languages automatically and no human intervention. But even if there is, there is very, very little need. And the added value of this is that actually the human user, the English users are also happier because it's kind of easier to, to read this kind of English. So in those kind of cases, if you, if you make the hard cases go away, then, then, then it becomes you know, much easier to translate. And here I can just give you some, some examples of, of uh, um, say, a legal text, because there is a lot of, I mean, here, this is really, really trained on, on very little data. And, and uh, I mean, you don't have to speak Bulgarian, it's from English into Bulgarian, this is the human translation, computer translation, you know, to realize how similar, how close, how high quality this translation is. 
and actually I was surprised when I saw it, and I saw it uh, eventually that there are many, many conventions that start in the same way. Oh, we have got together and in the spirit of cooperation and blah, 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 blah. I mean, taking into account this and in common rules and mutual assistance and this and that. I mean, there's a lot of crap that is repeated, right? And of course, when it's repeated many times, it's easy to memorize. So legal texts are very easy to translate. But legal texts are exactly the case that you don't want to translate with machine translation because you don't want different kind of interpretation, right? You don't want to risk it. Um, so, and when you have closely related languages, here this is trained on, on even less text, on ridiculously little text. And um, anyway, you can just trust me that this is very high quality. And, and in Bulgaria, we don't say that you translate from Macedonian to Bulgarian, we say you adapt. But that's political <coughs> things. Okay, so summary, what we have now, we have like usable technologies already. Those are translation memories. That this is what uh, translators use. We have web translation that is usable for many things, and ev every one of you, I believe, has used it. This Caterpillar English, Simplified English, is good. Another thing that uh, people are doing recently with the improvement of machine translation systems is post-editing. So instead of having a good professional translator translate, they just have a lower paid post editor, so we have automatic translation, then a human who goes and corrects it. Um, and what I want to say is that, in my view, computers are never going to be to replace humans as professional translators for one very simple reason. It's not quality. It's because they cannot be held responsible legally if they don't translate something right. Well, people can be. I mean, um, so another thing, why do we care about uh, machine translation? Well, it turns out that big companies care about translation. So SDL, Invest, uh, Winebridge, Facebook, uh, Sistran uh, has been uh, purchased by a Korean. eBay starts, uh, Adobe starts looking into this, Intel, and so on. Um, and finally, okay, I have here a slide that is misplaced. Just to conclude the talk, I want to give you some future directions. So the big dream of natural language processing is to make computers capable of understanding human language, right? Um, so you talk to them, just like in science fiction, this is 2001, a space odyssey, right? You talk to the computers, they understand, and you know they talk to you back, and so on, and maybe also translate, and so on. But I mean, you want them to get to the meaning of the text, right? That's, that's, that's the big dream. So. And we have talked here about translation, but I also want to point, point out about semantics. I mean, understanding the meaning of, of the text. And this is critical for the whole development of the, of the field. And um, machine translation, of course, is nice. This is the thing that started the whole uh, compu computational linguistics, the very first task, the most, one of the most important one, economically and so on. And it's practical, it's within the reach of the current technology. But those are kind of related. So let me tell you a little bit about semantics. Um, so if you want to, you know, the dream to come true, you should not look at superficial statistics, just like we do now with machine translation, pretty much everything that we do with language. And we want to go to the meaning of text. And, um, you know, we need some kind of revolution in semantics. And, uh, you know, you don't need to look at just with words. I mean, we will need to, to look at how those words are put together and how the semantics comes from there. Those are multi-word expressions. Those are semantic relations between the words. And and um, I think that the revolution will come from web scale corpora, from the injection of linguistic knowledge, and, and people are, are looking into this, but no big breakthrough yet. So there has been like a recent discussion on the corpora list, where somebody said that we want to should move lexical semantics from alchemy to science. And this has happened to syntax. So Chomsky has moved syntax before it has been like in the uh, you know when it was in the domain of linguists. It was like, okay, here's this construction, and we kind of describe it, and so on. But there were not really big projects to make it really a math, uh, make it really kind of, you know, a formal thing, you know, automata theories, and, you know, this kind of context-free grammars, and so on. I mean, he really formalized it, and it made syntax into, into a science, kind of moves it, make it more mathematical. The question is, can we do this with semantics? So moving to the machine translation, right, it's, it's an important task. They started the whole field of natural language processing. 
is the hottest machine translation uh, topic today. If you go to a conference in computational linguistics, about 40% of the papers are on, machi are on machine translation. Actually, 40% of the submissions of the papers presented at the conference, maybe 25, 30%. It's very hard to publish in machine translation. It's very competitive. Um, and it's very practical and of high economic expectations. So are we due for an evolution or for a revolution in that field? So, I mean, there has is a lot of evolutionary work, like resource poor languages that I have talked about, or morphologically rich, or, or uh, you know, using uh, noise, talking about noise input, I mean, how you translate emails, or chats, or Twitter, or spoken language, or even poetry, and this and that. I mean, all these are, you know, different kinds of research directions, but this is not something that is going to trigger a revolution. What about revolution? There have been two revolutions so far. I mean, it has happened twice. The first one is 1993, when the statistical methods came around, those IBM models. Before that, everything was rule-based. The second one was when the phrase-based model came around in 2003, 10 years later. When I talk about revolution, this is what I mean. So you can see a system from 2002 and from 2003. This is a word-based system, and this is a phrase-based system. You can see for yourself the difference. So this one on the left looks more like a word salad, and this has much more meaning, right? And, and also blue tells you about four blue points of improvement and so on. <coughs> so the question is, if 1993 there was this revolution with statistical translation, 2003 of phrase-based translation, were aren't we overdue 2013, right? Uh, we should have had uh, the next revolution. So actually people were, were thinking that the next revolution is going to come from, from syntax or semantics. So this kind of very popular triangle. You start with words, you can translate directly words, right? Those are the first models. And then the next level was kind of syntax. You go to syntax and then, you know, you, you take the, you know, say the Russian, you make syntactic analysis, you know what is the relationship between the words, who modifies whom, or oh, this is the subject, this is the object, this is the modifying adjective, and so on, right? And you make this kind of analysis, and then you translate this into the syntactic structure of the English, and then from there you generate the words. <coughs> it turns out that, you know, there has been this intermediate step that has been taken by, by phrase-based systems that don't, don't go all the way to the syntax, right? That have triggered the revolution. And people actually believe that going to syntax is going to trigger a revolution. Uh, theoretically, the next level is semantics. So you start with the words, maybe phrases, then you go to syntax, then you go to semantics, and you can translate semantics, the s you know, some semantic representation of, of, say, of Russian into semantic representation of English, and then from this semantics you generate syntax, and then from this syntax you generate the words, right? Or in an ideal world, you can have something like an interlingua, which is like language independent semantic representation. So you start with uh, Russian words, you do syntactic, then semantic analysis, doing this kind of interlingua representation, then you go back down. And people told that this is the way, you know, to move to the revolution. But actually it was found out that these phrase-based models, which are a little bit better than words, have triggered revolution. There, there is a lot of work on syntax. It works better for Chinese and for some other languages, but it's not really a, a general revolution for the entire field. Right? Um, actually, there might be an ongoing revolution. So there is an ongoing revolution in speech recognition. Like two, three years ago, people have found out that the neural networks that have been, you know, um, not really popular for many, many years because they have like much smarter statistical models, <coughs> right? Especially multi-layer uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, have have triggered a revolution in, in speech recognition. So uh, really, really better improvement. So now everybody has switched to this. And of course, speech recognition is a little bit older field than, than machine translation. So each time there's some novelty in speech, people in translation want to, to do it in, in translation too. And there have been attempts for since three, four years, like uh, around about the same time, the last two, three years, four, but no consistent, no good results. And and this this is probably starting to change. There is kind of increasingly best paper awards this year has been on very strong results on machine translation using neural networks. There are also very strong results on semantics. That's what I was talking a little bit about semantics. Maybe this is uh, this is something that might is 
is currently bringing a revolution to machine translation, maybe also to semantics, maybe also to the whole field. But still, those are very, very early results. We need the distance of a couple of years to see whether you know this is just a couple of papers that you know make a lot of noise, or this is something that you know is really make everybody change the way that they do research in this particular area. And you know, in my opinion, what we need if you want to achieve a better machine translation or in general better uh, language processing is you want web scale sem uh, you know statistics you want semantics you want deep understanding and we want linguistic knowledge you should not just look at at the words as such um and again i can stop here or i can okay of course probably the deep neural networks <coughs> but i can tell you a little bit about where i come from um, I don't know, how are we with the time and should I? <coughs> Any questions at this point? Okay, let me, let me tell you quickly where I come from and, and then, you know, and what we do and then, then we can have general questions. So, I come from QCRI, this is the Qatar Computing Research Institute. It's in Qatar. It's a nice location uh, with Iran on one side, Saudi Arabia on the other one, and Iraq a little bit to the north. Um, very safe place. <laughs> um, EMNOP is going to be here um, <coughs> this year. This is one of the major conferences in computational linguistics in October. This is Qatar. <coughs> this is Qatar. This is our building, the Tornado Tower, now at night. <coughs> So um, I'm from the Arabic Language Technologies Group. We do research in uh, computational linguistics in general. Um, a lot of work on Arabic, a lot of work also in English and in other languages. We want to be the world leader in Arabic language technologies and uh, to do research uh, with logo and global impact. And um, so here are some areas that we do. One is multilingual, that includes translation, machine translation. The other one is like question answering, dialogue systems, and then we have some smaller efforts like search, uh, information extraction, information retrieval, optical character recognition, educational applications, and then all kinds of tools and resources for Arabic. Here's our team, very briefly. The leader of the group is Dr. Stefan Fogel. Uh, we also have uh, Luis Marquez, Karim Darwish, Alessandro Moschitti, myself, um, and a number of other people um, that you might or might not know. Um, so machine translation, we translate news, <coughs> we work on translating news, we work on translating lectures, and our goal is to move into meeting translation, where you get, people get together, everybody speaks in his own language, and you do kind of real-time translation in both directions. This is also speech, this is also real-time, there, there are a lot of challenges there. And um, yes, so news translation, we have collaboration with Al Jazeera, uh, and, and we already have uh, something done with them. Um, lecture translation, we participate in competitions. We have won the last year's competition on machine translation between English and Arabic and Arabic English of uh, TED Talks in IWCUT competition. Meeting translation is something that is still ongoing work. In the future, we want to do translation whenever on whatever devices are, uh, are there. Maybe the smart glass, maybe Google glass, and so on. And that's it. Thank you. Um, есть у вас есть какие-то вопросы? По... Ага. Скажите, сколько языков вы знаете хотя бы в небольшой степени? Несколько. Ну я я я ну я говорю болгарский, русский, английский, французский, итальянский, испанский, немецкий, арабский. А что-то а португальский. А, а, а еще, еще там изучал немножко турецкий, немножко малайский, немножко арабский. Спасибо. А я не совсем понял, вы сравнивали по буквенный и посло и по буквенный пословный перевод малайско-индонезийский или решили, что это что вот, 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 вот дело, дело в том, что как-то между малайским и индонезийским там там, бы, там была разница. 
Логическое. написание. Было, было. было. Это потому что Индонезия это была хаванская, гаванская, нидерландская колония, а малейшая была английская. И вот поэтому как-то, когда там, ну как пишется, скажем, У, в Индонезии было О, Э. Это по-гавански, по по вот там, по-нидерландски это ОЭ. А, а, а вот по-другим это было просто Ю. Или, скажем, Ч, там, там в английских колониях это было СХ, а, 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 там было по-другому в других. И как-то были, были такие разницы, да, а, а, много, и там, там, но в один момент а, они сделали совместную комиссию и решили сделать ортографию в индонезийском и в малайском ту же самую. Так что все эти разницы они элиминировали. Так что, скажем, транслитерировать просто не надо. Это, это как-то вот, вот, это, это уже как-то уничтожено. Это, это, это не... есть, некоторые, есть некоторые слова, когда есть такая разница, но, но они просто изолированы, и их очень-очень мало. Да. Понятно. Ну, просто там, возможно, какие-то морфологические детали тоже можно было поймать по буквенным да, а, да. переводам. Но, ну, 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 в общем-то, они настолько близки, что как-то все говорят, это тот же самый язык, тот же самый язык. Хотя бы, ну, не так уж. Спасибо. Да. Первый мой вопрос такой немножко наивный, если можно. Вот, допустим, есть одно и то же слово, одинаковое слово в португальском и испанском. Вот, но оно, у него может быть разное окончание. Вот каким образом мы можем понять, что это одно и то же слово по стамированию, или там требуется морфологический анализ обязательно? Ну вот я, э, я это пропустил, но я могу вернуться. Я, я, я вообще, вообще не, не, не объясню, как, как, это, как это делается, это то, что, потому что я хотел, я опасался, что нет достаточно времени. Вот, вот здесь. Вот. Ну, вот дело в том, как, как вот мы... Чтобы научить хороший метод транслитерации, скажем, between португальский и испанский, да, мы, 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 хотим э, мы, мы можем это сделать э, на уровне э, э, букв, да, но нам нужно как-то научиться на когнатами. А что это когнаты? Это как-то слова, скажем, для нас когнаты — это слова, которые как-то ну, имеют э, э, сходное написание и исходное значение. Да? Вот, вот хочем именно, именно как-то э, элиминировать такие э, э, false friends, как-то ложные друзья, да? как скажем, gift in English, gift in gift, gift по-немецки это, это э, яд, а gift по-английски это подарок, да? или скажем, гудина, год, вот год, окей, год, год по-болгарски это гудина. А вот по-польски по или там по-чешски это час. Да? И вот, 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 вот такие да, разницы. Или, скажем, гора, гора. Гора по-русски это э, лес. Да? Нет, нет, это, 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 это mountain, mountain. А гора по-болгарски это лес. Значит лес, это не значит гора. И вот таких, таких много. Да? Э, вот как, как это сделать? Ну, мы хотим... Между, мы, мы ищем э, слова между португальский и испанский. Um, um, okay. I'll switch to English to explain this because they start terminology. So, okay, you want to, we look at the Portuguese, English, and Spanish English by text, right? And uh, we first do the word alignments, and we, okay, you, we have word alignments, and we have the probability of a particular Portuguese word to be translated with some particular English word. So you have Portuguese English, we do word alignments, and you have an idea about which word is aligned to which and with what probability. This is something that the word alignments models are giving us, right? And then you, you do the same thing for English-Spanish, right? And then you can, under some independent assumptions, you can 
uh, calculate the probability that this Portuguese word is translation of this Spanish word, right? Uh, uh, when you more marginalize over all possible English words, I mean, you have this Portuguese translated with as those 10 English words, and this Spanish translated as those 10 English words, and then you can calculate this sum, and you come up with some probability. And of course, you can calculate in the other way, because those are conditional models. And then what we want is, you want this product, right, to be, um, okay, you want to filter those that have a ve very low probability. So you don't want to, if, if the probability of translation, so basically, you don't have, we don't assume that we have Portuguese Spanish data, but look, okay, here's a Portuguese word, how is translated into English? Here's a Spanish word, how is translated into English? And with what probabilities, and we just look. And the thing is that we want to take those Portuguese and English words that tend to be translated with the same English, uh, Portuguese and Spanish words that tend to be translated with the same English words. And this is how we know that they are probably cognates. They probably mean the same thing. This is how we do it, right? And, and, and of course, and this is something about orthography. We want them to have some particular kind of percent of overlap. And if they meet both conditions, right, then we say evolution and evolution are, are, are you know, translations of each other. And then we split them into characters and you put something to you know, to mark the beginning and the end of, the, of this, and then we say this is a sentence and this is a sentence, even though those are, you know, we, sp we, we treat uh, characters as words and words as sentences. And then you build a system on this, and when you build a system on this, then when I give, you, give it a new word, it can generate for me transliteration. I saw one sometime uh, the PhD thesis of uh, Re Regina Barzilai, <laughs> and uh, she generated the data in this way. She got some famous book, for example, Leo Tolstoy, War and Peace, and of course uh, there is translation of this book from Russian into English, and I assume into many other languages. And uh, then she built up the method to uh, find sentences that are aligned uh, well to each other. And in this way, it is possible to get quite a big uh, parallel corpus. And I assume that such books like Leo Tolstoy, they, could be, uh, they are likely to be translated both in Malay and into Indonesian. So, and if we build up corpus in this way, would it be sufficient? So, okay. Um, uh, Regina Barzile, she was working on, um, on, okay, she was looking at different translations of the same book. So, so you have one book and then you have, and, and then she was looking for different kinds of paraphrases of, of, of those. So she has, uh, because books get translated several times, and, and she has been de designing techniques for this. Um, learning from, I, I, I have tried, so for example, for Indonesian English, right? I mean, you don't have enough data, you can go find, uh, you know, somewhere on the web, maybe somebody translated Harry Potter, or, 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 you know, other kinds of books, and I have found a lot of those, and, okay, not, not so many, but, you know, sufficient number. That's not a good training data. Actually, the good, because it's, it's really, you know, the literature, this is exactly the kind of translation that is, is really not literal. It's really, you know, the, the quality there is, I mean, it's very hard. It's very hard. It's, it's, and you cannot, it's very hard to find the correspondences word to word because the translator has, they basically rewrite the whole thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's really not, it, they, they want it to sound good. And um, if you want a general system, the best thing is news because it's kind of neutral and it's kind of better, uh, you know, it has also relatively good vocabulary, a relatively large vocabulary, and it's more or less kind of, it's, it's more literal and the she style is different. She, she built some kind of uh, technique. She didn't pick up all the sentences in one and another. She only, uh, she, she first rated by word alignment, how well they are aligned in the human translation. <coughs> Only after that, once she rated, she picked up the best sentences. And on based on that, th maybe it is possible already to train something else. So there has been also work on, on um, um, paraphrases for machine translation. So for example, the work of Chris Callison Birch 
uh, and the fathers where they are, you know, trying to, to, to do that. There has been also work uh, um, on mining uh, um, translation for comparable corpora. So again, it's similar kind of technique. So you have different news reported by, um, I mean, the same news kind of uh, by different news agencies and they're kind of saying things a little bit differently and you want to try to find some variability from there. But, uh, you know, all these are, you know, potentially useful, but they are not in the main, uh, uh, I mean, they, they are not in the part of the standard pipeline, just like, say, uh, the, the, um, the syntactic translation, right? It's, it's only applicable to some languages. So all these, or, or like something that handles morphology, like in Arabic, for example, it is a very specific way to handle morphology. Uh, the way that I have handled here morphology with of Indonesian of Malay is also a specific way, right? I mean, if you're going to handle Russian morphology, you probably do it in a different way. And then a whole bunch of languages don't need morphology at all. So, uh, for example, Chinese has no morphology at all. Or when you translate between English and French, you probably don't need to do anything special about morphology because, you know, um, most of it gets learned automatically anyway if you have enough training data. Вот на тему вопроса предыдущего товарища, можно же, ну вот если книжку взять, ее перевод, то есть вы сказали, что там много плохих данных, то есть переводчик свое привносит, но можно же, скажем так, такие места отслеживать, ну допустим взять там на уровне абзацев или на уровне предложений, и ну, если система видит, что это более-менее соответствует, она это добавляет значит, в битекст, а если она подозревая, что здесь что-то там не то, то она может это отбрасывать просто. Но там все равно как бы большой объем данных добавляется. Ну, де де дело в том, что вот и, когда, как, когда стиль тот же самый, да, вот, вот, вот когда, когда сильные системы машинного перевода, ну, лучше всего, когда, скажем, там правный текст, когда там много э, клишей, когда там много повторений того же самого и так далее. А вот это, это то, что наоборот в, в этой литературе. В, вот поэтому даже, даже если вот, скажем, эта фраза переводить так, это очень, очень хорошо звучит поэтически. Вот в эту книгу так, а в другую будет не так. А, а еще как-то... Вот есть, есть много доменов, для машинного перевода, так, так скажем, вот, вот для, 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 даже для профессионального переводчика, если он хорошо переводит, скажем, медицинские тексты, может быть, не будет такой уж хорош, когда переводит химию или, скажем, историю и так далее, и так далее. Если мы, а, и, или, скажем, может быть, он отличный специалист по медицинским текстам, но, но, скажем, когда он переводит Harry Potter, это ему не получится. Вот, вот то же самое. Как-то как не надо все как-то вместе там ложить, потому что когда там разные стили и так далее, и так ну, далее. Ну, понятно, да. да. Спасибо. Я думаю, тогда мы на этом закончим. Ну, я думаю, может, просто в одном подойти, сам задать. И, соответственно, давайте еще раз поблагодарим Прислава за его выступление.